to be with you. My name is Carter McInnes. I'm lead pastor and joined by, this guy sort of seems like a stranger, but he's not really a stranger. Yeah. I'm, he's I'm, just been away for a minute. I've just been away for five weeks on sabbatical. My name is Jake Davis. I'm the college and creative pastor here at Mountaintop, and it's good to be back. I feel rested and re-energized and ready to go for the fall. Yeah. And so you've been away. I know you've been watching online. Mm -hmm. We're in this series called Hardball, Tough Love from the Book of James. So we just kind of have been having some baseball fun. And man, you look so good holding those Braves. Yeah, I, I it's t-shirts. It's hurting me to hold these as a car, as a Cardinals fan. You're a Cardinals but, fan. Yeah. Any Cardinals fans in the house? See there. Yeah. Any, Zach Morgan. I any see Braves you, man. fans? Braves country? Braves fans? Okay. All right, we're gonna give these away. Just look, just look, just a minute. So my granddaddy did love Stand the Man musical. How could you not? Yeah. So that was his man, but he was diehard Braves too. Hey, listen, <laughs> if you are brand new. Thank you for being here, whether we are joining you in your living room or back porch or vacation, or you're in the room. Thank you for being here. We're honored. We'd love to connect with you. There is a QR code that you can use right on the screen. If you can connect with that or the back of your chairs, and um, it'd just be a great, great way to connect. We want to get to know you. You've taken a huge step by being here today, and we'd love to help you take some next steps and just getting connected. Yeah, and if you're watching online, go ahead and share uh, this service on Facebook. Or if you're sitting in the room, get out your phone, open up your, uh, your phone uh, to Facebook and hit the share button there because you never know who might be scrolling along social media this morning and might need to hear an encouraging word from God and worship with us today. So share on Facebook. You never know who it might impact. That's right. So, Jake, you've been away on sabbatical. One mm -hmm. of the things that we've just kind of put into our DNA here at Mountaintop is we want to keep pastors in the game. Yeah. And so <clears throat> Sabbath is so important, and so you've been able to take this break. I know it's been a blessing for you and your family, and it's important because you've got a big fall coming up. Yeah, it's been great. I'm, I'm super thankful for, for a church family that supports us as we kind of get some time to rest and relax and breathe. Um, it was a great time for Haley and I, my wife and I, to uh, kind of reconnect and re-energize and spend some time with, with our kids before the fall. And it's a big one because we're kicking off college ministry this fall at the end of August when kids get back for, um, for the fall semester. So if you want to be involved, just shoot me an email at jake at mountaintopchurch.com. I'd love to get you plugged in, mentoring a college student, leading a discipleship group, something like that. Um, but we get started this fall, so yeah. Yep, so you know college students in the Birmingham area, we got like five colleges. Get them connected. Okay, so it is a baseball giveaway. You want me to, you want me to take uh, yeah, those off your those. hands? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, who are the Braves fans? We got some Braves fans in here somewhere? Somewhere, somewhere. Let me see if I can hit right there. Is that, is that good? Now, yeah, are nice. there any Braves fans up, up top? Up top? Oh, look all the way up there. Okay, I got to see. I, I didn't do it. up a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I'm going to ball service. it up a little bit more. Let me see yeah. if I can, I can pitch it. Pitch it up here. Yeah, see if you can. Uh -oh. Let's see. Here we go. Uh oh. <laughs> hey! Very nice. John Smoltz. I didn't break the camera, so I'm that was, very, that was I'm a very worry. Happy about that. That was going to get deducted from my salary if I break the camera. So, yeah. All right. It's going to be a great day. Uh, hardball. Uh, that means I have this is my first time teaching in the series, and every preacher gets to pick their own walk up song. Oh, yeah. Like you're going Looking up to bat. To so, I'm pumped about that. You're teaching next week, so you get to yep. think all week about if that. If you have any suggestions, go ahead and give them to me this, this morning. I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but yeah. I, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a good day. Yeah, so uh, I'm so glad to be back after five weeks worshiping from home. Be, um, just glad to be back in the room with you. If you're watching with us online, let's all just go ahead and stand and worship uh, together as we worship our God. In the morning, and in the morning when the sun is rising, another day to tell of all your kindness. When I think of your goodness, oh, I sing for joy, I speak for love. And in the evening, in the evening when the night is falling, the troubles rise and I can't hear you calling. Oh, I don't have to worry, and I won't be afraid, I speak the name. Cause there's only one name. Speak the name, speak the name that has power. Speak the name, speak the name above all others. My Savior, Redeemer, my hope and my healer, Jesus, Jesus. No. 
towards him. So we pray that in this moment. I'm praying God come. Say that. I'm praying God come. I'm turning this thing around. And God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. We sing in desperation for him. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around, cause all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus, breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus, I pray God come. This thing around God turn it around God turn it around God turn it around Only you can call it all the name It changes everything So God turn it around God turn it around God turn it around It's all of my is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. Only you can guide. God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. See it, he's doing it right now. Come on. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. 
listening. And I love the fact that our God, when we come to him with whatever it is, he's listening and he cares deeply for us. And he doesn't mind that we keep asking him, God, turn it around. I need a change in my life because he cares so much about each of us. And even if in the midst of all of that, his answer is, hold on just a little bit longer. I have something I want to teach you. I have something I need you to know that I need to just let this thing happen. He still wants us to cry out to him. And this next song that we're going to sing is Spirit of God. And it talks, there's a, there's a phrase in here that says, um, we pray for revival and we start on our knees. And what we want to always say is that, that you would have freedom in worship. If you feel like you want to kneel and pray, feel free. If you say, I, I don't know if my knees can take it, that's okay. When we say those words, they also speak to our hearts. And if our hearts are surrendered and humble before God, that's the posture that we're looking for this morning. And we pray this over our church. and We pray this over our city and over our nation. God, we want revival to happen here. Amen. We pray for revival. We start on our knees. The Spirit of God pour out on us Whatever it looks like Wherever you lead Spirit of God pour out on us Spirit of God pour out on us Where the Spirit of the Lord Because where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom where the spirit of the lord is the chains will be broken where the spirit of the lord is the miracles come to pass as we pray spirit of god pour out on us sing and we pray for revival we start on our knees the Spirit of God pour out on us Whatever it looks like Wherever you lead Spirit of God pour out on us Spirit of God Spirit of God pour out on us Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, chains will be broken. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, miracles come to pass. So we pray, Spirit of God, pour out on us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is. 
But fear has no power Where the Spirit of the Lord is A breakthrough is coming Where the Spirit of the Lord is Restoration will happen Spirit of God, pour out on us. Spirit of God, pour out on us. Holy Spirit, we need you. The fresh wind of your Holy Spirit, oh God. back to you and we need your perspective fix our eyes on heaven turn our hearts to you Chains will be broken Where the Spirit of the Lord is Miracles come to pass The Spirit of God pour out on us Where the Spirit of the Lord is The fear has no power Where the Spirit of the Lord is The breakthrough is gone that is our prayer this morning, our humble prayer that you would pour your spirit out on us but not for our sake yes you want to restore us, yes you want to set us free but God you want us to be your hands and your feet, you want what goes on in this place in this church to spill out into our community, into our neighborhood into this state, into this nation into this world, so God we pray that your spirit would rest on us that you would empower us, that you would set us free. But God, let us be bold, um, bold instruments of your praise in this world, bold voices of love and grace and mercy, God, because you have shown that to us again and again. But God, we start on our knees and we ask, God, that you do your work in and through us. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is great worshiping with you this morning. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Hey Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Hey, can you believe that we are already more than halfway through with 2022? 
Woo, it's gone by fast, right? Um, so one of the things that we really believe in here at Mountaintop is transparency when it comes to our finances. And so at, at the end of every quarter, and we've just finished up uh, the second quarter, April 1 through June 30th, we always give a financial report because it's not our money, it's God's money, uh, it belongs to him, and that you give so generously to his mission and ministry. So our uh, second quarter giving update is that our budget for that quarter was 674500 and we all gave together 770916 Yeah, man, can I just say thank you. Thank you for your radical generosity. Generosity is uh, one of our... Uh, one of our values, and we believe in, um, in being generous because we serve a generous God, and thank you. I want to tell you about a little bit about what your generosity is making happen and how it's making a difference for the kingdom. It is making possible some really much needed updates that we're making in this room, and this week there's going to be some big stuff happening. This Over the last week, uh, we got new carpet on the stage. Doesn't it look fantastic? It just looks awesome. So in here today, you, you are sitting in these seats, because you came to the second service. You were sitting in the, the floor seats for the last time. Uh, and so after service this afternoon, we're going to take all these chairs up. And this week, we will be getting new carpet on the floor and on the stairs going up uh, for the first time in 20-plus years. So we need some new carpet. And then down here will be some uh, new padded, movable seats where we can shift them around. This space will be much more flexible for our student ministry, for kids ministry at VBS. We'll be able to have banquets in here with chairs around tables, and it's just going to be so much, so much better. One of the things that's going to be a change the next week, so when you come in, and if you've been here for a long time, you'll remember this, but this is a little bit of a fresh take on it. We have some new curtains that will come in this week that will cover our upper um, side section. So if you're sitting over there, uh, we, we, I need your help. Uh, you're going to have to find a new place to sit, but everybody on the floor is going to have to have a new place to sit too because it's all going to be rearranged. But we just believe this will provide a friendly um, atmosphere for worship, and uh, we're excited about it. And I want to tell you an incredible story that has happened uh, through this that only God could write. So we've been wondering and figuring out what can we do with these chairs. I have a pastor friend in Inslee who's going to take 50 of these, but there's a lot more than 50, right? So Cherie Moody, who's over our serve team, she's our serve team director, she has been on it. She made a connection with three Spanish-speaking churches in Bessemer that are coming today to pick up the rest of those chairs. And listen to this. One of those pastors told her, said, this, we have been praying about some chairs for our worship space, and this is an answer to prayer. So isn't that cool? Because of your generosity. Yeah, so gosh, man, I would just love for you, since you're the last one in these, just before you leave today, would you just say a prayer for some brothers and sisters in Bessemer that are going to be worshiping Jesus in those seats um, when... Uh, when this day is done. Of course, what we all give isn't just about what happens inside these walls. When you give, you are making an impact outside the walls. You may or may not know this, but we support several ministries in our city for Birmingham and for the world. When you give, you are helping, uh, you are helping women at the well house who have been caught in trafficking and are being served by the incredible ministry. You are helping children who have been abused who are part of the Prescott ministry. You are helping men and women who are caught in addiction through Awaken. You are helping clean water come to villages in Africa. You are helping the food insecure at so many of our our local food banks here in Birmingham. When you give, you are making a difference in the lives of people that you will never meet inside uh, this side of heaven. And one of those cr just incredible ministries is Save a Life, which ministers to young women for crisis pregnancies. And this past week, we hosted a baby shower for some of those women here at, uh, here at Mountaintop. And it was just an incredible way to bless these young women. And so I want to just say, I want to invite you, there's an opportunity this week with Save a Life because we don't want to just be generous with our money. We want to be generous with our time and our energy too. And Save a Life has an opportunity to learn about volunteering at their Crestview uh, location. And if you have been wondering, like, hey, I want to serve the city. I want to serve people who are in need. Um, if you have a heart for young women that are going through crisis pregnancies and trying to figure out what it is like to raise this child now um, or maybe give that child up for adoption 
or somehow just serve these young women, this is an incredible opportunity to do it. Becky Swindoll is our champion for that. And if you've never met Becky, you can do that and get to know more information about that. Or you can just take a picture of that screen and email there. Becky will be here at the New Here booth uh, right out the door when you leave. And you can connect with her and learn more about Save a Life. So thank you. Thank you for being generous for ministries that are making a difference in the kingdom. When you give in those boxes, when you give online and digitally, uh, you are doing an incredible work for the kingdom, and I just want to encourage you to do that. I know that I spend money on a lot of things. Uh, you know, I bought some World Games tickets. That was fun. I buy lots of food for my four boys, and, and it's gone like the next day. But there's nothing that I give to that makes a difference for eternity than giving to the local church and what God is doing it. And I love getting to be a part of something that is bigger than me. All right, hey, I'm excited about getting to teach today as a part of our series, Hardball, Tough Love from the Book of James. Let's play ball. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. Will this be the last pitch in the game? Will this be the last pitch in Billy Chapel's life? <laughs> There's no crying in baseball! Vaughn into the windup in his first offering. Just a bit outside. You don't know how to play first base. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell him, watch. It's incredibly hard. They say all they want. We're just here to play ball. How can you not be romantic about baseball? All I do is win, 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 no matter what. Got money on my mind, I can never get enough. And every time I step up in the building, everybody hands go up. And they stay there. I got sent to the principal's office one time for calling a teacher a name. I was the PA announcer for our high school baseball team, so I was that guy that would be like, up at the plate now, number 12, third baseman, Wes Melton. Shout out to my boy, Wes. And um, so I would do that, and part of one of the other jobs that I had was playing music in between innings while the teams were switching out and the pitchers would throw a few warm-up pitches. Uh, but it's, this was old school now, so you would actually take the mic and turn it on its side onto a tape recorder. I had like a baseball mixtape and push play and play the music. And so one of my friends, a gal that I grew up with, she was keeping the scoreboard. So, she, you know, usually just a couple of people up in this little, little tiny press box at my high school. And one of the player's sisters who happened to be a teacher at the school she just kept complaining. The music's too loud. Turn down the music. Sounded something like that. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I made several catty comments to, to my friend that was up there keeping the scoreboard. And after about four or five uh, innings of this constant complaining constantly about the music, uh, I turned to my friend and I, and I was thinking all week about how I was going to do this because I feel like I probably shouldn't say this word from stage. And I don't know that I should put it on the screen, but I figured out a way to do it. So I said, gosh, I looked at my friend. I said, she is such a... <clears throat> Now, I don't know where your mind is, but I said the first part rhymes with what, okay? Just so you know. <clears throat> and when I did that, I heard everybody go, ooh, because the mic was still on. Yeah, yeah. Now, can I just confess to you, since we're in church and all, 
that it is only by the grace of God and his grace alone that the mic was on for that name because I called her several worse names of which I'm very much now ashamed earlier in the day. But my words got me in trouble and it earned me a trip to the principal's office the next morning at school. And I wonder if you'd ask that teacher what she thought about that 17-year-old kid in that moment, what she'd say. I wonder if she would have said that kid was spiritually mature. Probably not. I wonder if she would have said that that 17-year-old kid was a follower of Jesus. I wonder if she'd even have been able to guess that that kid was a Christian. He'd have said he was. But I wonder if she'd have thought he was. Words matter. Words matter. Words matter, and you know this because you have, you have felt their impact. You've been on both sides of words that hurt. You've been in relationships in which words caused the riff in the relationship that ended it. Words matter. They linger and they last. They have the power to wound and the potential to heal. Words matter. And we're going to see by the time uh, that we're done today that something that James says, he says words determine direction. By the end of our time today, you're saying, whoa, that's a bold claim. I'm not sure about that. You're going to be able to find out why words are so important. It is because they determine our direction. Now, we're calling this series Hardball because the book of James that we've been studying a chapter each Sunday, it's hard. And today is one of those hard things. So before you just dismiss this and be like, I don't know. I mean, you think what the way we speak determined direct? I mean, that's a bold claim. Or maybe you're just sitting there thinking, I can't believe my preacher called somebody a name. Could you just have a moment of honesty about your own moments? Because you probably have some moments where you said something that you regret. You probably have some times where you called someone something you're ashamed of. You've spoken some words in haste or in anger or in frustration. You've probably had some moments where you talked out of emotion or you've felt the brunt of what somebody else said. And words have the capacity to be remembered for a long time. You probably have an experience, a job, or a relationship that was forever altered, not because of what someone did, but simply because of what someone said. Words matter, and they determine direction in our life. I, th I think one of the reasons that words matter so much is because I think they are a distinct, uh, distinct part of God's fingerprint on our lives. They are a distinct part of what it means for us to be made in God's image. I mean, think about it. We, we share a lot of similarities with most of the other mammals on planet Earth. But there's one thing that really uniquely sun, uh, sets humanity apart. And that is that we, we communicate. We have a language. We reason and we process our words. It, this is a, so much a part of, God, of who God is and his image on us. Think about it. This book that we call the Holy Bible, what do we call it? The, the Word. It's a word. When we feel God's movement in our lives, the way we talk about it, we say, God spoke to me. When Jesus, the apostle John, came to earth, John wrote that it was the word become flesh, made flesh. There is something about, something unique about our creation in God's image that is so tied to our words, our language, the way we talk, the way we speak. Now, the other thing I love about this idea is that James had an upfront window into this in the life of Jesus. It's such a unique. James was the half-brother of Jesus, so they grew up together. So James and Jesus were family. They lived in the same house, and I love that James had a very unique perspective, a front-row seat to Jesus's real life behind closed doors because nobody knows how you really talk like your family. 
right? I mean, we can put on a good show for clients. You know, the phone rings at work, and you're like, this is blah, 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 company, and how can I help you? And your teenager calls, and you're like, what? Right? <laughs> I mean, we do, we do a really good job of that at church. We come into church and say, good morning, good to see you, yes. Good to see you, Pastor. Good to see you. Yeah, praise the Lord. Good to be in the house. How you doing? And you know, just 15 minutes before, you were standing with the car door open, and you said, if y'all don't get in this car in three minutes, I'm going to commit a felony. <laughs> praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. <laughs> right? Nobody knows how you really talk like your family. And James didn't just know the Jesus who was teaching on the mountainside, who was doing miracles in the boat, who was, who was healing people. James knew the frustrated Jesus. James knew the teenage Jesus, the hungry Jesus. James knew the tired Jesus. And I think James saw something in Jesus and the way he talked to his family that Jesus when he was frustrated and he was hungry or he was tired, that Jesus talked differently than everybody else in the family. And maybe James saw that there was a big difference in the way that he talked inside the walls of their house and the way Jesus talked. I love it. We're getting a front row seat from Jesus' brother as to what he experienced in the way our talking, our speaking, our language is supposed to sound. So we're going to be in James chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, grab one. If you're in the room at the bookshelves when you leave, we'd love for that to be our gift to you. Now this, this section has about five or six metaphors. The cool thing is if you're new to church or new to faith or even unsure about church, there, this doesn't start off with some kind of a big theological idea. It doesn't start off with a bunch of churchy words. It's very easy to understand metaphors from the world. That This is what's amazing, that this was written 2,000 years ago, and these things are still true today. These metaphors still make sense today. Essentially, the science behind these metaphors hasn't changed in 2,000 years. This is, it's pretty amazing. So listen to what he says. He starts it off in verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So there's, you can't really disagree with this. This isn't some kind of big, profound theological statement. This is just sort of stating a fact. Any horse people in here? So this is just how it works, right? It's amazing. It's how it worked 2,000 years ago. So that's metaphor number one. Next verse, in verse four, he goes to metaphor number two. That's similar, similar thought. He says, or take ships as an example. So we've gone from horses to ships. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So again, it's not something that you can be like, I disagree with that. There's nothing to disagree with. This is just kind of like facts of how we understand horses, how we understand ships. This is this is kind of state, a statement that's true, that we, that we realize it's still true today, but the theme is the same across both metaphors. Something small directing something big. Something small giving direction to something much bigger than it. And that's a key to the very first word of the next line. It says, likewise. Likewise. The tongue... Is like, a, is, is like a rudder on a big ship. The tongue is like a bit in the, house, in the mouth of a horse. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So now he's gone to another metaphor. The tongue is like a small spark that can start a fire. It is like a rudder that guides a ship. It is like a bit that guides a horse. And listen to how he goes on. The tongue is also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Tell us how you really feel, James. It's hardball. The tongue 
is like a rudder setting the course of a ship. It is like a bit in the mouth of a horse. It is like a small spark in a dry forest. It is a small thing that can set the whole course of your life in one direction or the other. Our words determine direction. Words determine direction. They set the direction of your home. How many times have you ended up in an argument with your kids or with your spouse at home because of what someone said or maybe even the way they said it? Sometimes it's not even a word, right? It's, <sighs> right? We just kind of sigh. We just kind of grunt. Words determine the direction of your marriage. If you are always talking down to your spouse, if you are talking bad to your spouse behind their back when you're hanging out with your bros or you're hanging out with your sisters, if you call them names, if you're screaming at them, if you are making snide remarks under your breath, then don't be surprised if the direction of your marriage turns toward your words and they become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Words determine the direction of your children. If you continually tell your kids how useless they are or how stupid they are, don't be surprised if they live into those words. If you're constantly talking about everything that's wrong with the world, don't be surprised if you are able to find more stuff that's wrong with the world. If you are always talking negatively, don't be surprised if you see the world negatively. Words determine direction. And James offers no illusions that changing our words, that shifting our language, or as he puts it, taming our tongue will be easy. He says this in the next verse. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Anybody go to the zoo this summer? Take a trip to a zoo? Got a zoo, you just see all this. Or like a sh when you go to like one of these shows, and they got, I'm amazed at like the bird shows where they can get the birds and like, why don't the birds fly away? Because they're tamed. Anybody go to SeaWorld this summer or Disney World where they have like the dolphin shows? Isn't that amazing? They get these dolphins to do all these things. That seems like it'd be really hard to tame a dolphin. James says that's way easier than taming your tongue. Taming an elephant for a circus easy peasy compared to your tongue. He says all kinds of animals, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Whoa. Taming the tongue is hard to do, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And we're going to find out in just a minute with, with James's closing verses, we're going to find out why it's so critical that we do so, why we have to work at it. So I want to talk for just a minute that though it is hard and difficult to tame the tongue of some ideas about how we might. The first thing I want to share with you is this. Sharing opinions is optional. Did you know that? <laughs> Sharing opinions is optional. You don't have to share your opinions. You don't have to share your opinions with your adult children. You don't have to. You don't have to share your opinions with your coworker, with your neighbor. You just don't have to do it. You won't die if you hold it in. I promise you, you won't. You don't have to do it. And I know I talk about this a lot. Sometimes people say, oh, you talk about this a lot. But we live in a digital world, and you don't have to share your opinions on social media. You don't have to. You don't have to share your opinions online. And it was, so, it was listen, it's made it so easy, right? It's made it so easy. But you don't have, you, you don't have to share your opinion about, you know, when you have a, it's so easy. You have a bad experience at a fast food restaurant. You just want to get on Twitter and like at their corporate. And like, I just want you to know the Hoover branch or the Vestavia branch. It is like the most awfulest branch you've got. It's so easy to want to do that. Or you have a bad experience with a mechanic. You don't have to go on what's happening in Vestavia Hills and just tell everybody 
about how terrible this mechanic is. When you have a bad experience at a retail store, you don't have to go tell everybody about the terrible experience you had at this retail store. You just don't have to do it. Because, and this is why this is so important, because your opinions can and will change. Opinions change. And opinions are based on a, a slice of the information. You don't have all the information. Would your opinion about that young 16-year-old gal at the fast food restaurant that just had terrible service and got your order all wrong, would your opinion change if you knew that two weeks before that her mom had died and she stayed up all night because her dad's an addict and he's abusive and he yelled all night and she was scared for her life, but she has to keep coming to work because she's the one actually helping pay the bills? Would your opinion change? Probably so. Would your opinion change if that mechanic that got the stuff on your car messed up and it cost you $300 more? Would it change if you found out that the night before his wife of 20 years told him that she was leaving, that she was in love with somebody else, and his mind just wasn't all there that day? And he missed that on the diagnostic. Opinions change. You don't, you don't have to share them. And, and I know this is like, this is so different than. Like, if you're under 35, you grew up as digital natives. But if, like, 30 years ago, before the Internet, we had, like, address books with people's phone numbers in them. You remember that? And if you knew somebody 30 years ago who had a bad experience at a fast food restaurant, and they came home and got out their address book and called every person they know and told them not to eat at so-and-so, you would have said that person has problems. <laughs> but every time you put that on social media, you're telling everyone you know. You're picking up the phone. We don't have to pontificate on our platform. The words of Abraham Lincoln would be wise to remember here. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. Right? Have you ever seen a post in the last few years from someone and you're like, you know, I kind of thought they were a fool, but now I know for sure. Anybody ever thought that about you? Let's just post cat and dog pictures. Right? Let's post vacation pictures. Let's post encouragement. Let's speak digitally in a better way. And there's something really important here, too, another way that I think is so important to tame our tongue for a, di a separate group of people. And I, I didn't include this in the main scripture this morning, but it's the very first verse of chapter 3. And he says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And then he goes into this whole diatribe about our tongues and our language. And so here's what I just want you to know. If you are a leader, words matter more. Words matter for everyone. But if you are in leadership over someone, if you are a teacher, you are a boss, you are a parent, you are a coach, you are a pastor, you are a manager, if you are over anyone, Words matter for everybody. Everybody's words carry some inherent weight to them. But leaders' words weigh more. Leaders' words weigh more. And here, here's why I believe this is so important. And if you are over others in your workplace, if you are a boss, if you are a leader, this is so important. I firmly believe that most people do not hate what they do in their job. Most people do not leave their jobs. They leave people. And mostly they, lead their they leave their boss. And actually what they are leaving is often how their boss talks to them. And if you will be a boss, if you listen, if you're a leader, listen up. If you will be a boss who speaks encouragement, who talks with compassion and love, who speaks blessing over, your, over those who are under you, I want to tell you something. You will be a hard boss to leave. People will want to stay at your company because those bosses are hard to find. If you are a teacher, you will be the best and favorite teacher in the school because those teachers who speak blessing, who speak hope, who speak encouragement, they're the, they're the, 
they're, they're hard to find. The, the power of this on either side, negatively or positively, is so incredible. When I was in uh, elementary and middle school, I just, I just didn't care that much about school. You know, I just did just enough to stay above average. I was more happy being the class clown and just kind of making everybody laugh. And I didn't care. You know, if I, my grades were just good enough, my mom and dad wouldn't be on my back. And I'll never forget in sixth grade, my teacher handed me my report card at the end of one nine weeks, and he looked me in the eye, and he said this. He said, Carter, there is no telling what you could accomplish if you would actually apply yourself. I was in sixth grade. I am 45 years old, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. That teacher was at my school for one year in my little hometown. But it was that moment that I decided, huh, maybe I'll try applying myself. And everything changed. Words, if you're a teacher, if you're a leader, if you're a coach, if you're a boss, they matter more. Then James closes us out with why these, why our words are so important, why this is such a critical spiritual issue. Because for those of, so far, he's just kind of been stating facts, what he believes. He's been using these metaphors, but he wants to zero in on those who claim to follow Christ, who are in the church. He says this, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And we did that this morning. Speak the name Jesus. Remember, it was like giant on the screen. Big Jesus. We all sang it. You sounded awesome. We praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And I love this. I love this how James closes this little sentence out because it's just so simple. Out of the same mouth, the same mouth, come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this is so plain, so direct. This should not be. Hey, you, you know, guys, how you like go to church on Sunday morning and you sing praise songs and then you say something nasty about one of your coworkers? You shouldn't do that. It's just that kind of that simple. You just shouldn't do that. This should not be. This is not the way we do something. The issue that James is getting at is that our rever- words reveal something about our hearts. Our words of praise, James says, are in vain if they are followed by words of condemnation for those who are made in his image. James says it. what he's saying is this way, our words give a voice to our values. Deep down, we have values, and when we speak, we are revealing something about our values. They reveal what is in our hearts. Our words cut the line between what we say we believe and what we really believe. Really. They give a voice to our values. And James says, hey, the world has its own values. The world weaponizes words to create divisions, to create uh, political voting blocks, to create uh, competition. The world weaponizes words to hurt one another, to shame others. That's what the world, that's not what we do. We don't weaponize our words, James says. We, We don't curse politicians or opponents because they're made in God's image. We don't speak ill of those that we disagree with or even those who have done us wrong because they are made in God's image because we understand that our words give a voice to our values. And if you are in Christ, here is what we value, the gospel. And the root, the core of the gospel message is that we were opponents to God and God loved us anyway. The core of what the gospel is about is that we were enemies of God and Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. The point is that we were sinners. We were transgressors to God, but God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. We serve a gospel message that is about God reconciling our sinful, broken selves. So our message to the world is that we reconcile the world to Jesus 
We didn't come to condemn the world. We are here to help save the world through the power of the Holy Spirit in his church. We share this message. This is what we are all about. And if we really believe that, if we really believe that, then that it is not my job as the pastor, it is not our church staff's job, but it is every single person who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, who is watching online or who is in this room. If it is all of our job to share that message, then all our words matter. All of them matter. We cannot reach a world we are constantly reprimanding. And we cannot have a conversation with the world about Christ if we are constantly cursing the world. It just can't happen. It won't happen. And it won't work. And something I'm learning about this is how much this matters to the next generation. They want to know, the next generation wants to know if we are real, if we are, if we are authentic. And if they hear us praising God in one breath and cursing brothers and sisters with another breath, then they know that we aren't really who we say we are. Let me, let me put this a little bit more granular. If on Sunday morning you share our worship stream and say come join us and watch along for worship and then on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday you are cursing a politician you are complaining about a fast food restaurant you are criticizing the local high school football coach if you are blaspheming people online then here's what the next generation sees they are watching and they say you might can quote Genesis 127 that you believe you say that people are made in God's image but you don't really believe it and if you don't believe what Genesis says about people, then why should I believe what you say Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John say about Jesus? They're watching. And they're listening. Words matter. And James finishes off with kind of some more metaphors. Listen to what he says. These are kind of like rhetorical question metaphors. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Or a grapevine bear frigs? No. Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. You can't have praise in one breath and curse in another. Simply put, James says, words determine direction. So let me ask you this question. What direction are your words determining for your life? Is it words of negativity? Words of, that are hateful, that are hurtful, that are toxic, that are cursing? Or are they words of blessing, peace, the joy of the Lord? Are they hopeful and hope? Filled? Are they seasoned with grace and mercy? You want to know what your future looks like? James says. You want to know what your future looks like? It's easy. Listen to your words because they're setting the course of your life. And they can set it on a course for blessing. Or you can set the whole dadgum future on fire, James says, with what comes out of your mouth. Now, the good news about the message of Jesus is that God didn't just give us a book with all these hard things to try to live up to and say, well, good luck with that. Instead, Christianity and our faith is not just a book of rules or even encouragement and instruction for how to live it's a story of redemption or grace. Because here's what I know about this issue. We've all broken it. We've all called some people some names we shouldn't have. We've all said some things we shouldn't have. Uh, we've all sp spoken under our breath things we shouldn't have. We've all said things that we regret. 
But the story of Jesus is that on his last night when he was with his disciples, he took bread and he took it. He was giving them a picture of what was going to happen the next day on the cross. He said, this is my body broken for you. And every time you eat this, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember that when you're not perfect, I was broken to make you perfect. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And every time you drink this, I want you to remember that your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you don't know what I said to my spouse last night. It's, you're forgiven. You don't know how I've been talking to my kids. You're forgiven. Jesus, my Facebook feed needs some work. You're forgiven. Jesus, I, I just get so negative at work. You're forgiven. Jesus, if you knew what I thought about saying, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You. You. You sitting in those chairs, you're forgiven. You at home, you're forgiven. Your mouth is clean when you come to this table and receive this grace. And it's your choice what you do with that brand new clean mouth, forgiven, redeemed, when you walk out those doors or when you pick up that phone. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that you don't give us an impossible standard to live up to and then leave us on our own. Gosh, we fall short on this area, Lord. We, we mess up so much. I mess up so much. Lord, as we come today, every person in this room, those who would say, you don't know what I've done, you don't know what I've said, you don't know what I've thought, Lord, would you just speak those words? I know, but I love you anyway. We receive your forgiveness in the gift of your body and your blood. We remember. Help us never to forget. In Jesus' name, amen. During this last song, we're going to receive what's called Holy Communion. Some churches call it the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. It's just an example, a reminder of Christ's body broken for us, his blood shed for us. And you come and you receive, you take one of these little cups. There are some gluten-free ones available for those who need gluten-free as well. There's a little cracker in the top. And I would just encourage you a couple things. If you want to come kneel down at the front, and take a moment to pray. You can do that. If you, if you want to go back to your seat and receive it, you can do it there. When you return to your seat, I hope you'll remain standing as the band leads us in this last song. Won't you come? You're invited to be clean at the table.
One of my uh, favorite passages in scripture is Psalm 1914. I try to say it to myself as I wake up every morning as a reminder. It says this, it says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. And if we're, if we're gonna be a people that call Jesus our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer, then it's, then it's my prayer for us that our words would be pleasing to him, that they'll match the meditations of our heart. And if we're going to be a, a, a people who are, who are for Birmingham, that's the way that we have to live our lives. And if we're going to sing things like, all hail King Jesus, then I hope that the song of our life matches those words. If we're going to declare him Lord, we have to live like he is Lord of our life. And I get the privilege next week of preaching on uh, James chapter 4. And it tells us exactly what that looks like. How to submit ourselves to the Lord. To humble ourselves before the Lord. So I hope that you'll come back as we continue hardball next week to hear about that. If you want to get involved, if you're new around here and you want to get involved, we have some next steps that you can take. Hi there, I'm Glenn Denton and I'm the Next Steps pastor. And I have two great opportunities for, actually I have three, but two that I want to tell you about right away. One is if you want Mountaintop to feel like home to you and you want to really feel like you belong, one of the best ways to do that is to serve. And next Sunday, and the, actually the next two Sundays, you'll have an opportunity to meet all of our serve teams out in the atrium and find a place where you can get connected. But if you want some practice, I got a hint for you. Right after this service, if you'll stick around, we're gonna take all of these chairs and unbolt them. And we would love your help with that. So that's a great way to meet some new people and do a little exercise in the process. And if you're brand new, I would love to meet you. And there's a new here team outside that would love to meet you. Please stop by, tell us who you are so we can learn a little bit about your story. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, Jake. Thanks. All right, we say this every week because uh, we want to remember, we want you to remember. God is for you. We are for you. Let's be for Birmingham. Have a great week. In the morning when the sun is rising, another day to tell of all your of your goodness oh I sing for joy I speak your name yeah, yeah. the evening when the night is falling my troubles rise and I can't hear you calling.